Okay, cool. Welcome to the Walmart of Silicon Valley, the future of wearables. Um, Twitter folks, pound Mobile Monday, pound wearables for tonight. If you guys want to do comments and, and uh, shout outs. Um, how many people here first time tonight to a Mobile Monday? Wow, it's always like half. It's great. It's awesome. Um, how many folks in, actually in the wearable space? Like they're, they're building an app. How many app builders for wearables? People building hardware. <laughs> All right. All right, so introductions. Uh, I'm Mario Tapia. For, the, for, for those folks who don't know me, um, President of Mobile Monday here in Silicon Valley. Um, I've been doing this stuff for about 15 years, um, almost 300 plus events. And so, so a very long time I've been focused on mobile technologies. Um, and it is, uh, it is a, a, a labor of love and uh, kind of a passion for me. Uh, but also keeps me up to date on the latest trends. Um, so agenda tonight, we will basically have a welcome from me. We'll have a panel and kind of coffee talk. So people watching us know. And then uh, and then we'll also wrap up. We go back over to the um, to the kitchen and, and eat more goodies and food. Um, how many people like the the, the tea from Ed, you know, and, like the tea? So a big shout out to Edo and also sponsoring our tea tonight. <laughs> it's awesome. <coughs> Um, so a little bit about Monday, we're, uh, we're a nonprofit here in the Valley, but also in the U.S. we're a bunch of different cities. So Austin, Chicago, Silicon uh, Beach, which is L.A., and then Boston, Seattle, New York. And also we're in, you know, we're in Philadelphia, we're in Miami, and tons of other um, interesting cities. Also like uh, Detroit and Ann Arbor, it's also got a strong um, membership. Um, 140 plus cities around the world, so it's kind of, kind of a big thing. So how many people from out of town, from foreign, from a different country? How many people have been to a Mobile Monday outside of Silicon Valley? Wow. Okay. How many guys? How many people in Europe? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Asia? Yeah. So you always find some folks. Okay. Yeah. Like, all of them. The guys have been all over the place. Wow. <laughs> so um, so yeah. So when you guys travel, if you're on a business trip, you know, look for your local Mobile Monday chapter. You might be having some that night, which is great. And I think we had. Uh, I think uh, our friend Rudy came, came out from the East Coast, and he's from Mobile Mondays as well. Um, kind of the stats, like who, well, who's in the audience? And uh, this is typical, like when you guys signed up, you had all these questionnaires, and like, well, what does Mario do with that? And it's really to try to understand who you guys are. Um, how many people here are business development and sales? I carry that role. How many people are developers that write code? How many people are product and marketing? Venture. That's all right. Yay! Um, okay, uh, the unicorns, which are the designers. Who are the UX people? See, that's awesome. Cool. Media, bloggers, etc. Awesome. Cool. So, um, a little bit like, what do we do? Okay, so we have this monthly meetup. We also do something called Mobile Monday Labs, which is a little bit more technical. So, the audience would be pretty much all engineers. And then we do um, some VIP dinners for CXO folks, and it's typically like half big company, half startups. And we always talk about some topic. And we do have one coming up with Latin America, folks like Latin America and emerging markets. So if you consider yourself into Latin, like you're into Latin America or emerging markets, come and talk to me afterwards, because I have a couple of spots open for that dinner. Um, and then something new we started this year is called Mobile, Mon Mobile University. And this is like where we do a whole day deep dive into a certain technology. And uh, we just did beacons about a month ago. Who was at the beacon event? Yeah, so yeah, James. So, um, so where to find us? Um, like you're always like, where's Mobile Monday, and how do I get? How do I find a place? MobileMonday.us is a great place. And as always, we have multiple channels on like how to find us, and that's Meetup. We're also on Twitter. We also have Facebook events, so you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, for folks that you know, how many paid tonight? How many people had to actually buy, pay ten bucks? All right, so um, you don't you don't have to pay. You just like follow us on Twitter and and on Facebook, and we always give out the the, the promo code um, as an incentive. And then um, for many of you who also want to recap or share this event, um, we also videotape it. So thanks to John John, our historian over here. <laughs> I think we've done over almost sixty. The last, you know we started doing this a few years back, so we have almost sixty events um, focused on. You know, and record it. So it's a great. You can go back in history and check out all these cool events. Um, the team, you know, can't do this alone. So we have uh, a lot of awesome volunteers. With Ryan, we have uh, Monica is also on our operations side, so we'll be helping get this stuff done and working with our partners. 
Um, he probably ran into Chelsea and Stephanie downstairs. Um, they've been awesome, and also John has been great for at least documenting what's going on. Um, so tonight, I guess, for, uh, we could also, uh, thanks for our sponsors. So, uh, Orange Fab, had a good time. Um, our, uh, also, Tizen is our big sponsor for tonight as well, Tizen Project, and people are like, what the hell is Tizen? So, um, so, th so Tizen is a joint venture between, between a couple of big organizations. It's Intel, it's Samsung, and it's the Linux Foundation. And this is a version of an, like an Android killer, essentially. So it's a Linux-based operating system um, that if you have uh, some type of Samsung wearable or some type of Samsung device in the future, it will be based on Tizen. How many people have a Samsung TV? Yeah, most likely, if you bought a, if you've bought a new TV since August, it will have Tizen on it. So, um, so some awesome stuff happening there. Um, and again, hashtag Mobile Monday wearables. Maybe only shout out, it's Momo SV. It's our hashtag, or it's our alias. Um, also, another announcement for the developer to make your series. So, um, I've been trying to figure out, like, well, people come to me and say, all right, I want to, I want to reach out a bunch of Internet of Things people and maker people. Like, you know, where are they? They really, they really don't exist. Um, there really are developers and technical folks that are actually becoming makers. So, there's this large pool of folks that were app developers and are now uh, converting and I call them crossovers into the Internet of Things. Um, space. And so um, I've been trying to help facilitate this transition and so I have put together five events that are coming up the next three months. Focus on that. So how many people are developers again? All right, this is for you guys. So we're going to talk about platforms and think how do you develop to different platforms. There's some new operating systems. So there's Electric Imp, Spark. How many people have seen the Intel Galileo? ARM has got a project. So um, we'll be bringing those folks in to actually 45 minute to an hour session of workshops to actually learn how to develop to those platforms. And then um, designing. So basically, well, you know, how do I use 3D CAD system to design? Uh, where do I find a nice designer to now if I have my idea and build around the platform that I've selected? And then fabrication. This is the fun part. How many people have heard of Tech Shop? Stuff like oh, that. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll do 3D printing, laser cutting, all these cool, definitely tools. Like so, like, like, you know, it's kind of some, some fun stuff to do on fabrication. And then funding. Like, now, now that you've got your idea, you built your IoT thing, you have your prototype, and you go to an Indiegogo or Kickstarter, and then it just kicks off. Now you have a million orders. And, and then, uh, so we'll talk about the funding and go to market strategy and how to get people aware of your, of your Kickstarter and crowdfunding stuff. Um, and then once you get your big orders, we'll talk about producing at scale. So now what I do, Mario, I need a hundred thousand, I need a million orders of my little thing. Do I go to China? I have to take a flight to Taiwan, I need to go to China, what do I do? So we're going to talk about that as well. So um, if you guys want to know more about this, they're all free to attend. Um, you can find us on meetup.com, Mobile Monday, Mobile Monday Silicon Valley. You guys can register for that. We only, and it's limited, I think we're going to have about 50 folks in the audience, 50 to 100. Um, but it's meant to be interactive um, as a workshop. And um, basically a little bit about tonight. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at wearables and we're looking at the landscape. We're also having like, opportunities and challenges. So we have some awesome folks on the panel and they'll introduce themselves. Um, but at least we'll, we'll take a deep dive. We started with some questions, but then uh, we'll leave some time for you guys to ask questions. And I'd also like to introduce Pascal and Pascal the do our greeting. And you, you want to come up? You want to do the full website? Oh, yeah, you can, yeah. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Pascal. I'm orange. Like the view? Yeah. Like the space? Yeah. My yes. wall. Uh, <laughs> how many of you have been to Europe? There you go. So you heard of orange, right? <laughs> Who has not heard of orange? They're like, I don't want to say. <laughs> um, so we're a huge uh, telco company in Europe, large footprint in Africa, Middle East, Europe. Um, and so basically, uh, we're not operational here. We can't get an orange network, but uh, we're here. We 55 people of us. We've been in Silicon Valley for 15 years. We're kind of the outpost of orange here, the eyes of orange, and, and kind of helping with any type of a identification of disruption, um, threats, or even opportunities. And a year and a half ago, we launched a an accelerator called Orange Fab at Orange Fab. That's the beautiful website here. Um, we're at season. We're recruiting. Still recruiting for season four. You can apply late, which means um, 
we kind of know what's up with the top 30, but you can still give it a chance and, and we might select you too. Um, and so the new thing for season four is that we are joined forces with um, all of these companies right here. These are LG, FNAC, which is the Barnes and Nobles in France, Laura Mellon, which is the Home Depot in France, Hilton, and all these corporations decided to piggyback on our deal flow and, and pick a top 10 with us um, and, and potentially um, join forces with us to grow the startups, to distribute the startups, and to be in touch with the innovation in Silicon Valley. So this list is only going to grow for season five, so keep that in mind. We're adding more retailers, if anything is interesting. Anybody in this is interested? We provide office space. You might have seen the startups on the other side. Um, funding, office space, Paris, trip in Paris. We five startups in Paris. The stuff we do, we cover all the costs and flight and stuff. We get a lot of startups in the items of space for some reason. Um, Amber Light from season three. Um, we also have like Tracker in my nose, the main competitor of Tile, and, and Eden, which is a um, pro that can the soil and tells you the quality of the soil. Don't With that, what's that? Don't get a free trip? <laughs> they would get a free trip if Orange likes them, so yeah, it's kind of just yeah. yeah. Orange Fab. Yeah. OrangeFab.com, look, apply late, right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thank you all. Uh, enjoy the, the evening, and uh, Orange is very happy to have you tonight. Thank you. Come on up. Come on down. Grab a, grab a seat, guys. Yeah. And then we have... Um, we're going to have to share the mic. Oh, and one other announcement before um, MEF Global Forum. You guys have a postcard on your chairs there. Some people have it, some people don't. Look at the bottom of your chair. There is a prize. No, uh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, just joking. Uh, um, the MEF Global Forum is coming up next week. Um, you guys have an awesome discount code there. Um, and I think also, you have also a great discount for startups. I think it's at $2.99. Uh, Kim, are you around? Kim, where are you? Kim is in here. So Kim, Kim is with MEF and she's around here tonight. But uh, you guys, uh, the discount still is valid um, for this for this coming week. So um, hope you guys can take a look at it and attend. Um, all right, Whew. and I have openings. Um, let's talk about uh, wearables. And I'm, I'm gonna let, uh, we'll start with Ileon and yeah, introduce yourselves, um, name, what you do, why should, why should I care, kind of, kind of introduction, and just uh, we'll go down, the, go down the line. Okay, I'm uh, Eliane Fiolet, I'm the co-founder and editor of Uberismo, one of the top gadget blogs in the world. We publish in uh, three languages, English, French, and Spanish, and uh, I have a French accent and recently became American, and we are very, yes. <laughs> So I'm, I'm working on the Californian accent, actually. Uh, and um, we are based here in San Francisco. We started uh, almost 10 years ago uh, when the trio was cool. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> and so we have been uh, focused on covering mobile devices, um, wearable tech, uh, smart vehicles, and robotics uh, since uh, that time. And uh, today, actually, wearable is, is becoming cool again in uh, Silicon Valley. And, and we are seeing a uh, uh, Harvard startup uh, again. So something that we didn't see for a number of years before, because the costs uh, have been reduced. Uh, so that's basically, uh, that's me. And uh, why you should care, because I, I, I'm like seeing uh, Many, many wearable devices. <laughs> yes, I have more in my bag, I have more in my office, so some, I think I know something about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Deepa. Uh, my company is called Cuff. I am probably the least likely person to be on this panel. I'm an interloper. I've landed on your planet. Um, I had a very, very simple idea, which was to make a wearable that 
women would actually want to wear. And I somehow uh, back-ended into a platform, which was a word I didn't know before I started my company. Uh, we launched in March. We have a bunch of uh, traction. Uh, we have a bunch of partnerships. And I think we're approaching wearables in a little bit of a different way than um, other people. And I think we're opening the doors for um, other players in the space both in terms of brands and also other people to appreciate the power of them in terms of um, end users. But I'm a random one. I was a lawyer and a journalist, then I was the VP of product at Restoration Hardware that I obviously founded a tech company in my um, linear <coughs> career trajectory. Yeah, was, I mean, it's pretty, I mean, magic eight ball, yeah. predictive, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, now I'm here. You should care because Mario told me to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I came. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Darren Sabo. I work here at Orange, uh, along with Pascal and Jameson, and uh, about 52 others. So what we do here is, as Pascal said, we're essentially uh, innovation ambassadors for Orange Group back in Paris. It's a really interesting position to be in. It's our jobs to keep a tab on Silicon Valley, recent uh, emerging trends, uh, interesting startups, interesting <laughs> entrepreneurs, uh, and feed that information back to Paris along with potential business opportunities, which can take a variety of forms. Uh, sometimes it's co-creation of actual products or services or proof of concepts. Sometimes it's partnerships or licensing agreements if it's a much more mature, mature business. And other times we feed the startups into the Orange Fab Accelerator and try and get them a pilot. Uh, that happened the most uh, recent season um, we got a health-related startup called MedWhat into the accelerator, and now they're, well, I guess, four months later, um, we're just finalizing the details for a pilot in Botswana. So we're actually able to take these startups out of uh, the incubation period. If they have a product, something we can actually put in the market, we can help introduce them to country managers uh, and get that into market. So my focus is on digital health, right? So I work directly with the Orange Healthcare Group in Paris. And if you're not familiar with Orange Healthcare, right, I've been around formally since about 2007. It's about 200 employees. Uh, we operate, well, Orange Healthcare operates in 20 countries. Um, we have products ranging from IT and infrastructure support for hospitals and care providers to remote patient monitoring solutions all the way to uh, health and wellness applications. So uh, wearables falls into a variety of those a variety of those targets. And uh, you should care because I could help get you guys into the market. <laughs> cool. You can test us out. It's too late. Thanks, Mario, for having me. My name is Mike Neighbors. I work for Samsung, a uh, division called Media Solutions Center of America. So what we do, we source apps and build partnerships with uh, Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 apps, pretty much at all verticals, um, and specifically with our emerging devices. So primarily, as of late, with the Gear S, which will be coming out this week. That is sexy, though. <laughs> yeah. Pretty slick device. Can you so make phone calls from it? You can. Yeah, you can make phone calls. Maybe I'll call you during the panel here. <laughs> um, but it's the first 3G uh, supported wearable device uh, as, as far as a watch. If there's something else I'm not aware of. It, uh, but it, takes a, <laughs> it takes a nano sim on the back of it and uh, it's much improved. It's two inch super AMOLED screen and uh, 20 minutes of talk time. No, it's actually <laughs> solid. So. Uh, I'm sure we'll be telling you guys quite a bit, but truth be told, the prototype of this device, the battery was very weak. Um, and I was just amazed at the finishing touches that we did on it. So I get about two and a half days of time on this device before charging it. So it's uh, really substantial. But uh, yeah, look forward to talking to you guys and hearing the rest of the panel um, as we talk about wearables. Hi guys, uh, my name is Bashir Ziadi. I go by Bash. Uh, no relation to the shell for the developers in the audience. Got that? Okay. Um, so uh, I've been doing. Yeah, Bash's parents are really nerds. Yeah, I wish. I went to UC Berkeley or something like that. Uh, I've been doing sensor systems and biological sensor systems my entire career. Um, I also have been done a mass consumer product. Um, so you know, Guitar Hero. I did the guitars for Guitar Hero. 
And I brought that recently to um, Basis, which is you know, where I'm working now. And uh, we recently got acquired by Intel, so we were just launching our second product. Um, <laughs> that guy, not quite as fancy as this, but more sensors. Um, we're more in the health. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah, that's fancy. <laughs> You'd have no response. I, uh, <laughs> that's what we're here to talk about. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I've you know been observing the the market and the the experience and building product in this place for uh, a while, and I'd uh, love to contribute and talk about it. Cool. Thanks, guys. All right, let's get down to questions. Um, so it you know we, we last year we saw a big spike in a lot of buzz about wearables and. And, and definitely even this year, 2014, was you know, a lot more buzz, and there's a lot of chatter about wearables, and I, you know, yeah, I went to Mobile World Congress, and I saw huge, I mean, large areas just to get dedicated to wearable devices. Um, we saw the launch of Apple, Apple Watch. We saw bases get acquired. And you know, early in the year, I think um, there, there was a forecast of 90 million wearables that are out there. I haven't, I haven't seen any data yet to show like well, what actually did ship this year, but I just want to get your guys, you know, feedback on like, you know, are, are wearables really mainstream right now? I mean, how many people have a wearable type device in the audience, like Jawbone and Pebble, etc. Wow. Okay. Cool. So yeah, what are you guys' thoughts? I mean, is it, is it mainstream yet? And and what is the barrier for it to become mainstream? So, I don't know where you took the 90 million. The ABI research in February. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In February, they're saying, yeah, there will be 90, 90 uh, million yeah. wearables shipped this year. Okay, uh, I'm giving some figures. So, I don't think it's uh, mainstream yet. Yeah. Because the, what I have is like there was like 1.8 million fitness tracker shipped in 2013 and 1.9 million smartwatches. And, but it's not the whole <coughs> wearables. But for me, it's like the mainstream wearables that you can buy at the Apple store. It's not like uh, medical devices or stuff like that. So I don't know what they include yeah, what in the... That, what that research yeah. So, but compared to the <laughs> one billion smartphones that shipped in 2013, it's not yet mainstream. Or the seven billion cell phones actively, active on the planet. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe you have another take on that? So I think there's several answers to this. First, I think with the media, it is mainstream. Um, I think with OEMs, it's also mainstream, now that Apple's released their watch. Uh, but I think with the critical mass of consumers, it's not mainstream. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into probably a lot of reasons for that today. But I think the biggest reason in my mind is education. I think there's um, even the core functionality on this device or some of the previous devices I feel like shocks the general consumer. Um, so that leads me to believe that there's um, really very little understanding of app ecosystems uh, on wearables to this point, and also just general utility. You know, do you actually need that? Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think there's, you know, multiple answers to that, but I do not believe, I, I agree with her actually, that I don't think with in consumer electronics that it's mainstream. With cells. Uh, do you want to go? Oh, please. please. <laughs> okay. So it. I, okay. I think it depends how you define wearable. Right? I think we should define that because if you define it just based on functionality. So, what two years ago, three years ago, wearable was a Fitbit. So it was a pedometer essentially that you wore on your wrist. Now you have that type of functionality on your cell phone, right? So you can make an argument, <clears throat> if it's just something you wear that, gives, that counts your steps and uh, gives you a baseline uh, understanding of your activity throughout the day, yes, wearable, that sort of functionality in wearables is <laughs> mainstream. But if it's something with advanced functionality, such as a smartwatch, um, I, I think the big barrier there isn't necessarily the education, it's functionality, what do you do, the value to the user. Um, so if we're talking in the healthcare space, right, so you're counting your steps, you're quantifying yourself, you have all this data on the user, then what do you do with it? So you're seeing these, these really sharp drop-off rates, 
don't quote me on the numbers, but I believe it's at six weeks, 70% of people. Back in the drawer. Stop, yeah, back in the drawer, somewhere around there. And I think that speaks to just the value of the wearable or lack of value for the wearable. And especially in the medical side of things, or just health, let's just say health and wellness, not talk about medical devices. Uh, there have been a lot of false promises, I think, from uh, wearable device manufacturers and a lot of letdowns, and um, that's kind of burning out a lot of early adopters. So from my point of view, yes, if you're talking just basic functionality of like just tracking activity wearable, I think it is mainstream because you have it on your smartphone, but for broader adoption, I think there's still a long way to go. Yeah, I'd like to add to that in terms of uh, what you said about education. Uh, I think that, uh, I think I have, you know, a, a young company and we very purposely didn't launch in March with fitness for a couple of reasons, not the least of which was that we don't want to be a me too. Uh, and second of all, uh, you know, there is this back of the drawer phenomenon. And uh, because of that, we tried to think of uh, what concept or what um, habit needed a facelift and what could, um, ha what people, what we could use as an example for people to reimagine what else wearables could do. And we came up with safety and security, and I can talk about that more later. But because of that, because we launched with this idea of security, like, you know, let's, let's give a facelift to I've fallen and I can't get up, I have interfaced with people um, that a lot of people in the wearable space don't interface with. It's not the early adopters, it's not the Silicon Valley side, it's nobody who would be in this room. Some of these people don't know what Fitbit is, and we forget that. And I, I think it's really important if you're thinking about a consumer product to remember that, you know, may, is it mainstream for what? In terms of, you know, what is the function? And um, what is the suite of offerings you're going to give these people in order to make it, edu make it mainstream? And that's why I want to give you an anecdote about education. Um, one of the first partners we signed is not in the tech space at all. And it's going to be a pretty neat way that we get our product out there. And when the iWatch came out, you know, I'm thinking, what are they going to think? What are they going to think? Do they think this cannibalizes what they're trying to do? Or you know, are, are they going to have second thoughts about, you know, signing up with a startup? And the CEO of this company calls, and he's just laughing. And I said, okay, that's a good sign. And he says, isn't this fantastic? And I say, yeah, why? And he says, because the largest and most respected tech, comp tech company in the world is now socializing this idea for the world, and all they have is a watch, right? And I mean, obviously, not all they have, because we all know the power of it. But this idea that this idea that everybody gets this stuff now is is wrong. And maybe enough people get it in certain silos, like in the medical space, in the fitness space. But trust, I'm selling products to everyone from you know the Real Housewives to like the 99 year old women in you know in Michigan, like next door to my mom. And some of them, there's a whole spectrum of understanding on uh, what this actually does. I mean. I think I'd like to echo a lot of what you guys have been saying. Uh, you know, as we've seen in the past couple of years, we've seen the number of companies entering into the space just grow dramatically. Uh, I can remember the time where you know we were designing our product to specifically target the two competitors in the space, um, and now it's like, oh yay, another wearable launch. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. And so again, education is an interesting one. You know, the rising tide is in fact rising all the boats, and it's opening up a lot of interesting niches. But that also opens up, you know, the question of what is a wearable and how big is that market and how are you going to start dividing that market up in the long term. I think, um, so Darren a little bit about fitness versus hardcore health. And I think that's where, I mean, we're, I think we're starting to learn about wearables and kind of the data that we can collect. So which one has the better opportunity? Is it, is it really going to be? Durable. <laughs> Obviously it's durable, like durable wearables. Adorable. Please are going to storm it. So, uh, um, you know, uh, <laughs> so, Keep product placement. So the question is <laughs> fitness versus hardcore health opportunities here. Okay, so um, I'm going to select, for example, the one I started to cover wearables on Basis, well, one of two companies. Basis had the value proposition of their health rate monitoring. Now, uh, the, the mainstream, I would say, consumer uh, smartwatches, they offer the, the, this, uh, this benefit. But I've been testing uh, many smartwatches and sometimes their health rate monitor doesn't work or it's not accurate. 
So the question is like, we will have maybe two kind of devices, the very, very advanced medical devices with a lot of accuracy, with a lot of like, and we can count on that. And the consumer maybe uh, devices where you can have like some fitness features and some health fit, uh, features, uh, but they might not be very accurate. Um, secondly, I work out, and for me, a fitness tracker, a pillow measure, it doesn't work. It, it's no value because they cannot the the, the treadmill or if you're yeah, if you are lifting weights, you have to enter all your weights, and it doesn't make anything for me. Okay, so um, you know maybe. People want to track if they do um, enough exercise, being told what they, what they need to do, or, uh, and they need to have more, more services and more value in this. Otherwise, uh, after six months, 30% of people, they stop, they stop using it. There, you have any? Yeah. Um, so, I deal with this all the time. Right. Uh, most of the wearable startups I talk to uh, want nothing to do with the hardcore medical space because it requires, you know, on average, 18 months applying for FDA approval, clinical trials. Uh, they don't even know where to start. Uh, they don't have anybody on their board or any advisors that have been through the process before, and they just want sort of a quick win or a quick acquisition or something like that. And so they put out. So they go to China, they source these super cheap sensors now. I mean, you probably know the actual numbers on this, but you can get these sensors for like dollars, literally, uh, and slap something together and try and sell it for 60 bucks. But again, it's just like another toy. And uh, in the medical space, in the medical space. I mean, if it helps motivate you to get up and walk more, God bless you, awesome. Uh, I mean, I think that's what it's for. But when you're talking about improving health outcomes, so in the healthcare space, is really the, there's a value trifecta, right? You have if you're addressing uh, innovation in the healthcare space, you either need to come up with something that can reduce costs for the healthcare system, can uh, improve outcomes, so improve patient outcomes, which requires that sort of clinical trials and things like that or improve the patient experience, right? Those are really the three main value propositions. If you don't have, if you're not addressing any of those, you don't really, it's a really hard sell in the uh, medical space, right? So, uh, example for something that Orange does, let's bring it to what we do and uh, what we actually have in market. So there's two products that jump out in my head. One, we have a connected pacemaker Right? So I, you probably don't consider that like a wearable, but guess what? You wear it, right? And it's crucial to your health. Um, so it monitors, uh, obviously, the heart rhythm of the patients. And when they wake up in the morning, it just pings a gateway, right? And the gateway pushes the information to the cloud and it gets added to their uh, EHR. So a sort of a electronic health record that their doctor can monitor and look for abnormalities in their heart rhythm, right? So that is improving outcomes, right? And in the long run, reducing costs for follow-up visits. Because now I don't have to go to my doctor to download this data. It's automatically happening. Uh, another example, we have a product on the market where um, uh, it, it, it's... Uh, for, for people with um, uh, sleep apnea, right? So you know, I don't know if anyone here has sleep apnea or knows someone that has sleep apnea, but right now the treatment for that is generally wearing a mask at night. It's like one of those oxygen masks. And a big issue with that, and it works, and it works well, but there's a major compliance issue. The patients don't wear the masks, right? Which leads to high blood pressure or just a laundry list of potential problems down the road because they're not getting the oxygen they need when they sleep and their outcomes just take a turn for the worse. So it's a connected oxygen mask essentially. So in the morning, again, pings the network, a doctor sees uh, if the patient's been complying with wearing this at night and is able to give feedback to the patient. Right? And there's a mobile app associated with it that will give you little reminders or just let you know, like, hey, you haven't been wearing your oxygen mask for the past three nights in a row. This is how it could potentially adversely affect your health. 
Right? So that's outcome-based results. That's what we need to see what for, if you want adoption in the healthcare space, that's the kind of value you need to add to the system. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, just make it better, essentially. So, that's what I have to say. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. I think, um, <clears throat> I was talking, to, I had lunch with a company called Life Channel this week, and they've developed 12 different apps, wearable apps, um, and they're working with very large insurance organizations, um, you know, also hospitals and doctor groups, and um, they're making great strides in that space. But theirs is, they're mostly working with health companies, but their platform is wellness with consumers. I sort of feel like that um, your question was fitness, or I'm sorry, yeah, like fitness or hardcore health. And I feel like um, on the health side, you have wellness and health. And when I think of hardcore health, I sort of see that as a, as a separate beast. And I think that there's a tremendous amount of innovation that needs to occur with our healthcare system. It's, it's very broken. And, you know, I don't really think doctors can fix it. I don't really think the government can fix it or insurance companies, but technology has a chance. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in that if somebody, you know, takes the time to actually go and gain an understanding of the healthcare industry and how antiquated so many areas of it are. Um, with the consumer electronics industry, really with the critical mass, I feel that it's, uh, you know, wellness and fitness are huge because there's a lot of people that, uh, I feel like that is going to touch a much higher number of people uh, earlier on. Um, and I think we already see that in, in wearables to date because almost every wearable has a fitness component. Um, but I, it's hard to say like which one is bigger because I think that the hardcore health actually could be more transformative and just amazing leap forward for our human race, right? But I think the wellness and the fitness is um, it's getting a lot more focused right now and it's a lot more mainstream. It's bashing it. you, you you have a lot of sensors on that device. Yeah. And maybe you want to share a little bit about a lot of the at least the 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 health data that you that you are monitoring and maybe at what grade level is it maybe is it FDA approved? Yeah. You know, so know. I've actually worked on an FDA approved device before. Yeah. Um, we are absolutely not an FDA approved device. <laughs> not cool me anywhere near FDA. <laughs> um, the FDA is a scary, big, dangerous government organization to startups and smaller companies. Um, but at the same time, there is some interesting ground that has not been explored that gets close to the borders of FDA land. Um, and yeah, you know, everyone's right. Everyone, everything they've said, I completely agree with. Is uh, you know the process to be a medical device, you know, medical monitor device is a compulsory need. People must have it. Therefore, your market's fantastic. You know, they will buy it. If it has sufficient patient outcome improvements in a market that's funded by insurance companies, then it will get funded and subsidized and it's a fantastic place for you to be in. Great way to get acquired by some of the big companies, Medtronic, you know, J&J, all the guys. Um, being a guy who's a sensor guy, you know, working on a hugely complex sensor product, we've, we've explored a lot of that space. And, you know, again, a lot of the early sensors that we've built sucked, honestly. Like, uh, but people have learned, people have changed, people have grown. And much to the same sense like the original um, Fitbits, now that's, that's par for the course. If you don't have a pedometer in it, now people are like, well, why doesn't it sense this? It's almost like it's expected. So, you know, there's all these sensors that you can put in and all, they all serve different purposes, but that's just first order data. That's, what is my heart rate? How many steps have I taken? That's actually not interesting. The most interesting question is, how does this affect me? How do I become a better person because of this data? How do I become a healthier person? How do I live longer? How do I have happier children? How do I have a healthier life? How do I get to have better indulgences when I do want to indulge? How do I improve my willpower? How do I sleep better? These are all the questions that people are trying to answer right now. And we start with the data, and then we move upwards, and we move towards the human aspect of what, this, what health means to people. So on the sensor side, how, how close are we? How many, how many years out are we really for the sensors to be really accurate? So, um, you know, 
and, and, and the U.S. We're, we're not headed in the right direction in terms of health, right? 50% of our population in the next 20 years will be in the obese area, which I probably am a member of, uh, and, uh, and, but also diabetes, right? And so these are going to be huge. I mean, we're going to see, we're going to see a large portion of our 20-year-old kids coming into you know, type, type 1, um, the, di the diabetic. So where are the sensors right now? How, how close are we? Absolutely. So there, every type of system to sense is unique and special into its own. They're their own little unicorns. Um, the reason we've ended up on optical heart rate for the sensor system is that it seemed to, seems to do the best. It's still really hard. Uh, to give you a sense for diabetics specifically, the amount of insulin in your blood is about this amount of um, sugar that's in a pack of sugar. Now there's about five liters in your blood of blood on average. Now to detect that optically, that's you know a few molecules of insulin through an aperture of like that big, right? So that's a fairly complex system right there. A lot of people have been trying to solve this for a very long time, and there've been books. Yes, <laughs> there's been books written about how it's impossible to solve optically, and how other mechanisms need to be made. Um, again, you know, sensing other things like what is health? Well, if health is you know the neuroreceptors or uh, neurotransmitters firing off in your blood and you're like, you know, how your cortisol levels reacting, you know, how um, aggravated you are. All these things are really hard to detect. Um, so there's questions about can we use secondary sensors, secondary mechanisms to detect this. All that stuff's really far out. But, you know, as we increase the number of people trying to solve this problem, um, you know, leveraging this whole free market system that we think is actually really good, uh, hopefully we'll be able to solve it faster and faster. Got it. Yeah. So this looks like the next question I have is, all right, well, so for Warbles, why are they so focused on fitness? I mean, okay, so here's some, here's some numbers here. Um, this is a Wired Magazine article that was just published um, covering the uh, Washington, the uh, MODEF just did a, a Wearables conference in DC uh, a couple of weeks ago. So as of September 30th, there were 266 wearable devices on the market, including 118 fitness wearables. This is wired. Um, with 23 slated for release before the end of the year out, of course, for holidays. So 118, it's like uh, almost half of the wearable devices out there in the market are fitness related. Why? Why is that? I think because it's uh, the most obvious. It was uh, a pedometer was obvious. I guess maybe an engineer can. Yeah. <laughs> and what well, uh, is the most obvious consumer uh, application? But a recent uh, GFT survey actually um, showed uh, it was conducted in five countries: China, uh, Korea, Germany, UK, and one more. And they discovered that the consumer, what they want. The, 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 the uh, application they want is like payment from a wearable device, controlling the house, controlling the car, and uh, uh, identification. So but dif different countries have different uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, demands, like China was the, the most advanced to have like, all these features, but the Germans, they were like 20% of the people um, surveyed uh, when it came to uh, healthcare, you know, healthcare data, they were because they really um, are concerned about privacy. And I think that's the difference between countries. So, so it doesn't it doesn't feel that they, they are interested in fitness anymore. So, Diva, yeah, I mean, what, your your product. Yeah, what, so you, I, I what are the areas that you focus on? Well, to first to answer your question about why there's so many about fitness, yeah. I think to um, Bash's point. I, uh, the, look, the body has limited real estate, right? If you're wearing something on your body, you probably want to track your, you know, some, some biometrics. And I think that it is true that it is a little bit, it makes sense that tracking that stuff can add, uh, add to your life, add incremental value to your life, make you live better. And I think that's why that was the first iteration. I also, however, think because of everything that's been said here about the unreliability of the data, uh, that's why it hasn't become completely habit forming. I also, uh, I think it's really interesting about the, um, I have literally nothing to say about fitness versus hardcore health, I have nothing to add, but there is a, philo a philosophy around that, you know, in the sense that it's, one, it's very, very clearly fulfilling a need, like you were saying, in the hardcore, uh, hardcore health space, versus what I'm doing, which has the ability to delight. 
and there's very different ways to approach wearables. And there, there is going to be, you know, a hybrid. My hybrid is fashion and function. How do I make this something that sort of merges the two? Um, in hardcore, in the hardcore medical space, you won't. Who cares? Like they're not going to care if it's glitzy, if it's doing a job really, really well, right? Um, and if it's adding value that they didn't otherwise have. Look at garment. Look at garment. Garment. Oh yeah, exactly. Garment, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I have no idea what that is. Oh. <laughs> so I, my computer is like just running stuff. So it's very hard to work. No, my computer like. like what's like, what's Garmin? Garmin? Anyone? Okay. Okay. GPS. Yeah. GPS. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so it's running. Like GPS running. systems, health, like running systems, biking systems, stuff that's for athletes, like hardcore athletes. Right. And I've yeah. been doing that for years. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not beautiful equipment. Right? <laughs> no, no, it's really ugly. <laughs> what, are you on the record? Horrible UX. <laughs> 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 yeah, I like it. Does it work? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does work. You're right. <laughs> no, it does work. <laughs> it does work. Yeah. yeah. I have it does good. We'll use it anyway. So, so it's also, um, the way, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the hardcore fitness, but here, here's some interesting data that also came out. Um, you know, so what makes a, a long-term commitment for measuring and, and, and tracking? So, so, so here's kind of the, the question, why are wearables not sticking? So here's another interesting fact. It turns out, and I know that, the, 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 that wearables aren't just sticking, right? So how many people have bought a Jawbone and it's in the cupboard now? Yeah, see, or the battery type. Um, so it, it looks like, um, <laughs> It takes about um, six months from the unboxing to finding it in the junk drawer. So, so the, the, the question here is, you know, why, um, uh, so basically, more than half of the US consumers who have owned an activity tracker no longer use it. And a third of, a, third of them, like, basically dropped it within six months. So what's the, what would be, well, let's start with Bash. That's for a product design. Why, why is this happening? Uh, this has always happened. Um, how many diets have you stuck on for longer than six months? Uh, how many, I don't know, individual things did you carry with you for longer than six months? Notebooks, that's it. Um, even before they were connected, uh, you know, polar chest straps and their heart rate and watch, like you could get that for about 99 bucks at a, a sports store. In about six months, it's in the back of your drawer and you're not using it anymore. Um, this is something that is a continuous problem, and it has to, I think it's more fitness related, the problem. I think the, the value add of smartwatch features, I think, starts to break away this mold. Also, you know, we really haven't solved the habit forming problem of the product design experience itself. Um, there's lots of people working on it, and everyone's you know, working their best, and we'll see what happens there. For me, for me the, the, the most uh, important friction when it comes to fitness tracker is the battery life. And so the only one I was able to, to wear for uh, many months was, uh, was a Shine. Because uh, you have like four or five months of battery life. And I don't want uh, another fitness tracker to plug with my smartwatch in addition to my phone. So that's me and a lot of people. I tell you what, that's the one, one uh, number one complaint uh, from consumer is the battery life. Uh, secondly, the, the Jobon, I'm, I'm a woman, the shine is more elegant and it's smoother. Jobon is very, very tough to, to wear and when I have a dress, I cannot wear it. So I can only wear it when I have some outfit, which is not the case with the shine. Unless so there is a lot of... Yeah, maybe there's an opportunity. No, there are a lot of, you know, there are, well, yeah, 50% of the population is, is female on the planet, so, but it looks like a lot of uh, wearables are designed by Silicon Valley engineer for Silicon Valley. <laughs> 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 I'm, yeah, 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 and I'm, I'm quoting, it's not my quote, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, Sonny Bu, uh, CEO of Shine, who said that. So, I'm quoting him. So that's that's my take on it. So I, I don't. Well, okay, Mike. Uh, this question for Mike. So um, I've been waiting for this, you know, this Dick Tracy watch to come out for a couple of years, because now with this new version of Gear S, I I can leave I can leave the phone at home and just wear the watch, and maybe and then hopefully the battery life could last me a day or so. But then, but I'm still, you know, maybe this is the start, right? Because maybe they weren't as the utility of them. Because if you get used to them where they provide 
really specific data. I hope to the day in the next couple of years that I can leave this thing at home and just wear the watch and, and I'm off and running, right? Like take phone calls, Bluetooth, et cetera, I got LTE everywhere. Um, I can have email, you know, just basic stuff that I can just consume the content, information, not really have to react to it all the time. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, um, you know, the reason I think fitness is, is just so prevalent and the spotlight on fitness kind of goes back to um, what Bash says. It's, it's kind of the rite of passage into the wearable space at this point because everyone's doing it. So I feel like if you were to drop a pedometer or, um, you know, you didn't have a, a well-functioning heart rate monitor or accelerometer, you're sort of just missing what everyone is looking for uh, fundamentally. But uh, I think when, going back to education, I mean, with this watch and developing partnerships, um, fitness is just one small vertical in what we're trying to do. So, um, I mean, just across, uh, you know, from banking and finance, I was just having a conversation, you know, to uh, entertainment, news. Yeah, what are uh, the, I mean, daily, so you, you're, on, you're on the forefront of partnerships right now for that device. What have, what are the verticals? What I mean, fitness always comes to mind, but what is what are the other things that really people want to do with the watch? Well, I think um, the goal is really to um, I mean, for instance, your mobile phone it sits in your pocket. We all download apps, and when do we actually go back to those apps? Like, how often do we actually get the full utility of these apps that we actually care about? Um, they sit in our pocket, and they we get push notifications, but they just they load on our dashboard, and we we'll clear it, and we don't even pay attention to it other than Facebook. So I think this is like a, an opportunity to actually get the notifications that you want in a less rude way. Because, uh, you know, if I was sitting here talking to you guys and I was pulling out my phone and, and going through, you guys would be like, okay, why is he out of the mic? But if I looked at my watch real quickly, I could, in a split second, get a push notification or a rich notification and be updated on something that's going on. And I think in the enterprise, this is actually, um, it's sort of a whole other conversation. But I was talking uh, Salesforce, one of my clients. I worked with them for a while on in this space. And um, there were two things that I thought really early on that would make, would sort of move the needle of wearables. One was the Apple Watch coming out. Because I felt that it would sort of force consumers to make a decision, you know, because all, OEM, all OEMs are doing it. And I do feel like, you know, high tide covers all stones or lifts all boats, I believe that to be true. So instead of it being a discretionary item, it could actually be something that we need to make a decision on. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And the other side I thought was enterprise early on because it's sort of a modern day pager, if you will. And now that it's 3G supported, uh, you can really limit the, um, you can take a lot less of a productivity hit on multiple things. So if you're in transportation, uh, whether it's you know scanning barcodes or just taking a call or texting, you can keep people off Facebook, provide uh, a much simpler device that can go with your toys, and then just having it on your wrist gets a lot of attention. So if an employee, <laughs> if an employee is wearing this, they're a lot more likely to probably want to work this into their daily lives after their work day. And the amount of people that they come into contact with will make a difference. And I feel like that's going to help us all as that happens. And uh, from the 3G support, we'll see. Like this, this is the first device I just got it. I don't even have the nano sim in it yet. Uh, but, you know, I believe it's going to be really cool. And, you know, waterproof activities. I mean, if you could go uh, paddleboarding and have your watch and, you know, actually understand a little bit about your fitness as you're doing that, take your phone calls and text messages. It's kind of neat. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on your body. So it's a lot better than having this device. So I think there's a lot of utility. And I think across the different verticals that we are sourcing partnerships, and it, you know, it's, it's full spectrum. So, I mean, I don't really want to like name drop all the companies and stuff because the device is coming out. And we have, you know, marketing in order for that. But um, there's, there's quite a bit of utility that I think the general population is not aware of. And honestly, I would have no idea if I wasn't doing the partnerships for it. So I think that, you know, this is going to, you know, come a long way in the next couple of years if we educate properly. And 
just to, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I think a lot of it is how you, okay, so full, di full disclosure, I used to work for Samsung back in the day, and uh, one of the projects I worked on was the launch of uh, HETV and flat screen TVs, back when no one knew what the heck, the flat, why they would need a flat screen. Right now, who doesn't have a flat screen TV? Okay. Yes, I have a TV. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> no, it's uh, LC, liquid crystal and silicon better picture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you're a video file. So, um, but what we what we learned really early on was it, it's not educating about the product or the features necessarily. It's educating about the experience. You're selling an experience. What is that experience? And a lot of a lot of startups don't really understand that, and they focus on the technology. Or, and maybe that's a factor of it being developed here in Silicon Valley by people who never talk to other people and they just <laughs> sit in front of their computer monitors and you know they have spec sheets and that's how they communicate. Um, but as soon as you start communicating in terms of experiences, how this is going to change your life or make your life better, or you just really have an impact on your life. I think we'll see more adoption for more complex features, whether it's connecting to smart houses, because uh, you know, Samsung, you have the uh, whole connected home uh, 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 platform. So uh, there's a lot in that CES last year. I mean, it was great to see how like, everything interacted in the household. But again, it's selling the experience and making sure that experience resonates with the consumers instead of just pushing it on them. You know, uh, so a lot of it has to do with messaging, I think. I have a question here. Let's, um, so we've been looking at, right now, the last couple questions have really been about the market. Like, hey, what is the opportunity here? How big is the market? What is it adopting? Is it, you know, I, I, my forecast was like, I, we're not going to see mainstream with wearables for the next five, seven years. It's until the, the, the Walmart shopper in Oklahoma buys a connected watch, then you really need it. I mean, that's my opinion, right? Um, so I think just like with cell phones, because this, the phone we have today was a phone and the idea I was selling 15 years ago. 15, it took us 15 years to get to this point of 3G streaming video. This was the idea. This was like, this was the dream everyone was selling 15 years ago with, um, with, the, with mobile and data. And it took us how long to get here? And then how many, billions of people, but when it does kick, it does happen fairly fast. Um, but I, I just don't think we're on that elbow of, 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 uh, of uh, adoption. Um, it, so the next couple of questions, maybe we'll, we'll focus on product and some other opportunities there, but so let's, let's, on the product side, you know, there's big data here. This is the biggest thing, it's like, forget the hardware, but you are collecting this awesome amount of data about people, et cetera, and what are, what are those opportunities um, from all that data, what what can we learn from that? Because it knows where we are, it knows um, uh, it knows our some health information, knows, so maybe we'll know some demographical information. Um, but guys, uh, chime in on you know what, what are some of the big data opportunities here that we can find with wearables? Because there's going to be other businesses that come out of forget the hardware. It, this is big data business. One really really quick point: um, the earthquake. And how many people woke up? That was the coolest that was information. Pre that was also pre <laughs> creepy information. Yeah, it was. Right? Like, what? <laughs> Tell the do it. Yeah, that's all I just yeah. said. <laughs> that was super cool, actually. <laughs> we were super impressed that they could respond that quickly to that kind of event. Um, having looked at uh, everyone's sleep data. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, we're, we're still digging into that. And, um, you know, having spent a lot of time looking at the data myself, a lot of it are, uh, confirms a lot of your assumptions. People over the age of 65 in general don't have a weekday or weekend differentiation in their sleep pattern. You know, San Francisco parties a little bit earlier than New York parties as far as staying up late at night. Um, silly stuff like that. Uh, yeah, the, you know, we're getting a lot of data. We're getting a ton of data from our device. We're getting it on crazy resolution. You know, we're pumping a ton of data up through the, the cloud into our servers. Um, the, the thing that's exciting about that is not necessarily the data itself, but more about what it's saying about you. You know, did you get excited when you went to this place? 
did you, you know, do you work out more or more, more with these people? What types of things are you doing when you're with these people? You know, how do you sleep after you're at this location or after you're with these people at this location? How does that vary? You know, what are the factors to your success for your health journey or your whatever you're trying to do? Um, and then, you know, still investigating a lot of the partnerships, like how can people really leverage this? Aside from just the, the raw data, you know, we blow the Framingham heart rate study out of the water with the number of data for the duration. Like, the real question is, how do we make that useful and actionable? What about privacy? <laughs> <laughs> hey, who's, at, who's asking the questions here? But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the other one is taking over as moderator. I'm <laughs> All right. So. I'm a German. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No, let's let's, let's no talk about that. Just well, I, why I say that? It's just because uh, uh, I think for historical reason, the German uh, in any uh, Q and A uh, uh, panel, uh, the German John is still the one asking more. Uh, more question about privacy. They are, and their laws are more strict in Germany but, but, for privacy. I love the Germans because they're not, they're very private about their lives, but not about their private parts. Let's go on to the, uh, yeah, let's go on to the, it's privacy. The data that you guys collected. It's so sad. Yeah, <laughs> it, gets, it, gets, it gets anonymized, yes. hopefully, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, but, uh, well, but well, anonymized, when you see how uh, Google is uh, giving uh, some information to the NSA, I don't know. Well, so, you know, that's she brings up a good point. Germany has the most strict data laws in the world. Uh, you have to have opt-out, not just opt-out, but like they have to delete all the data um, historically for the user. Uh, so it's it's pretty intense, and it all has to be encrypted and all that stuff. It's kind of worse than HIPAA. Uh, <laughs> so you know that's fun. It's worse or good? Well, worse for the implementer, <laughs> better for the user. Uh, the the privacy one's interesting. Um, of course, you know Google can always do interesting things with the data, and I don't I don't I think because we haven't answered the question of how is the data valuable explicitly, like we haven't really solved that yet. We don't necessarily know what the pressures that are being applied to privacy from the business side are. And for example, how do, how do we know that in the future the healthcare companies won't access this data to change the, the rate of uh, insurance? We have no guarantee. We have no guarantee, do we? Did you guys read the PricewaterhouseCooper uh, survey on wearables that came out like a week and a half ago? No. Did you read it? There was this, it was it's really good and really exhaustive, and you can get it online. But there was a cool statistic that um, some, over 50% of employees would opt in to letting their employer look at their information if it was anonymized, um, if it went down, if it took their healthcare cost down. Their company, you know, if, uh, their employee-based yeah. healthcare uh, plans, and I think it's really. I mean, privacy is huge in every not less than mine because yeah, mine's, mine's true. But um, I, I think there's. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're some savage. Privacy is still important. Regardless. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm I know. not saying anything by yourself. No, but I think the privacy thing. It, it, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a dumb topic because how many people have a Facebook account? How much? Like, how many? How many billions of people have it? Six hundred. <laughs> Six hundred million people now have almost a billion. We give a ton of our personal information away for what to get access to our friends' pictures. How about our email? How many people have a Gmail account? Have you guys read the the the, 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 the terms and conditions? But not my health rate, not my blood. Pressure. But I know. I but I get to see all your personal chats. I get to see all your personal information, even the photos that you share. That be very personal. I mean, I think it's 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 kind of a moot point when you talk about like, hey, what about my information, etc. You are giving way more information on just using these messaging services and social media than I think even that's so great. You have high blood pressure, but then I also I could probably tell from your email that you do have high blood pressure from the things that you're eating, <laughs> from, you know, just some, the, the, the stressful situations that you do, right? Uh, I, I I think I could infer a lot, right? And I think Google. It kind of oh, yeah. can it for uh, the health of its users just based upon the, the, the large data that they're doing. And that's, I think, more part of my point is that big data is not just on the wearables. It's, just, it's like an aggregate because 
that alludes into the these health platforms, the fit platforms that Apple and Google have now rolled out. Because now they're aggregating. They created a platform that aggregates all of those connected devices, right? And I don't know how many people. So I don't know, maybe Bash, you're probably you're very familiar with, <laughs> you're very intimate with what's going on with these platforms, right? And so Strava and all these other guys. Um, so I, I maybe you have some some comments on the at least on these fitness platforms or they have their health platforms. It's iHealth. health. Yeah. Good. So yeah. Uh, from what I think is it's still. It, go, it goes back to defining the value, right? So if I'm giving up some privacy, right, it, I want to get something in return from mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And as soon as you define what you're getting in return for sharing that information, whether it's free access to a platform to share information with your friends, there's the value proposition for Facebook, right? Yeah. Uh, for Google, it's more targeted advertising, mm -hmm. right? So for health, should be, you know, ideally it would be, uh, you share your uh, uh, health, your fitness information. Let's not say health fitness, that gets a little trickier, mm -hmm. like lab results and things like that. We'll keep that separate. Well, that, that's HIPAA compliant, right? So that's yeah, yeah, really that's, like that's different. But when we're just talking, did, yeah. when we're just talking fitness data, yeah. right? Uh, if we're just thing. talking about the data that I'm sharing with, say, basis to understand my sleep patterns better so I could get better sleep. Mm -hmm. And they're making a promise to me saying, hey, you'll be more effective during the day. You'll, you'll be more awake if you share this data with us and we're able to use it to push uh, some behavioral change sort of suggestions to you, mm -hmm. right? Then you're giving me something for my data. And I think the problem is when you're taking, but you're not giving me anything back. So you're taking my fitness data, Right. Or my location data, and I don't get anything for it. Now, now there's a problem, and I think that's when the privacy issues really come up. Because if you're just looking at it as a negative, like oh, it's going to cost me more for my premiums, not you know, they could really use this to help me turn my health around, to reduce everyone's premiums because I'm going to a doctor less, right? So the whole system spends less money, but they have to communicate that too. I said yes, yes, uh, but I wanted to um, actually uh, throw this question because on all the panels on, about wearable and IoT, uh, there's a question that is um, not very much uh, addressed, and actually nobody has a real answer. Uh, and it's a question that a lot of users they, they are like worried about uh, because uh, health is a very, very, uh, very intimate uh, topic for. People, it's not, not. Yes, Facebook. Yeah, I post my picture of food, and if you look at my food picture, I, I should be uh, obese, I think. <laughs> but it's not the case, you know. So, no, because I, I post a lot of food pictures. So, um, <laughs> but so um, yeah. But I, I'm conscious that uh, Facebook is looking at, at what I'm, I'm posting because I get uh, a lot of uh, restaurant uh, advertising in return. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's something, uh, privacy is like a concern for, for people. So that's why I asked the question. I mean, it's a good question to ask, and it's always something we should be thinking about as we create these data platforms in the future. Um, to, much to your point about you know, these initial platforms for collecting and aggregating this data, you know, the, the first person to, the first company to start feeding all their data into these platforms is going to be the schmuck. But the third company and the fifth company, then all of a sudden you're starting to get these aggregate value. And now you can start using that data for other things, creating more value from it. Um, it does open up some interesting questions about who owns what, who can access what, what's important, what's not important. Um, and to the Facebook point, you know, when you uh, download and agree to the app, it accesses your microphone for a reason. Or, or for example, uh, in your iPhone, there is you have to drill down ten level to uh, to disable the, this function by default that actually store all your location minute by minute. So it's another example that you uh, it's not opt-in. Now it actually now it is. Um, so now it's when you do a new phone, it does pop up. It says, "Do we would you like to enable location?" But if you're a converted user, yeah, you're, you're SOL. <laughs> and, and, and to Mario's point earlier about inferring 
a lot of this information. If you may, if, if you just do a Google search for uh, symptoms of high blood pressure, <laughs> and you look at other search behaviors, and you're and you're logged in, and you're logged they, in, they yeah, you're logged in your Gmail account. I mean, yeah, yeah. they totally there you know. go. Yeah, yeah I, don't even, I don't even need to know what your blood pressure is. Yeah, you just know. Know. I know you're concerned <laughs> about it, yeah. and based on where you're checking in on Foursquare or whatever. I know you're eating a you know Kentucky Fried Chicken five <laughs> times a, a week, and there, that's all you need. <laughs> Let's. Um, I want to bring this stuff back over to on the product side because we've been talking a little bit about market and then talking a little bit about the big data stuff. But all right, so um, I mean, and I think Bash had mentioned this is one of your questions. So basically, the, they call it the, the stack, the technology stack. What, what's in, what's involved with the wearable device? You know, we're challenged with power. We're challenged with the size. We're also challenged with connectivity. We're challenged about all the sensors that go inside there, the interface and apps and API. Um, so what, what, out of all of these, which is probably the, the, the largest obstacle when it comes to wearables? What is, what are they, what, from, from a consumer perspective and a product perspective, what is the biggest issue? Is it connectivity? Is it the, is it the battery size? What, what is it today that actually is a big obstacle? For me, it's battery, but you go crazy. So I mean I think batteries across all technologies. Wow. Yeah. Still and by the way, fifteen years of mobile devices, battery's still number one. Yeah. It always it's always been the number one biggest gripe. I'm still waiting for Tesla to come yes. in and just rip oh. things up. <laughs> Um, I think that's big. I think uh, you know connectivity. We'll see. I think it actually has a, a cool opportunity. Yeah, that, that thing must have a super small radio. I mean, that thing is just tiny. It, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty it's amazing. Um, but you know, I think right now I'm not sure that we are really stifled by the capabilities of the device for the wearable space to grow tremendously. Um, I think there's clearly like it's a young industry. And um, part of the reason why we're sitting here and like fitness is like, oh, everything has to be fitness in order for it to even hit the market is because it's a young industry. And, uh, you know, it's sort of the elephant in the room if people don't pay attention to the status quo. But I, I think this is, you know, just like anything else, Mario, you said you think it will be five to seven years for wearables to, you know, be so at least for it to become, you know, until the Oklahoma Walmart shopper walks in with the wearable. Yeah. I kind of see it that way. Unless. Unless we can bring the price down, or it's some. Well, it's, like it's closer than you think because I've been pitched uh, uh, two weeks ago a twelve dollars fitness tracker. <coughs> so, and they 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 want to put it in Walmart. So we'll see. <laughs> well, I think there's going to be. Uh, we are going to have the Oklahoma Walmart shopper with the wearable for this. <laughs> okay. I think it's clearly the desire of all the OEMs and tech enthusiasts for it to be the next frontier. I mean, people want this to happen. So I think it is going to grow each year tremendously. Um, but it takes time. I mean, like he's saying, you know, Oklahoma, just a mid-America consumer, he's, you know, could be right. But that doesn't mean that it's not going to grow a lot because that's, um, you know, that may be the least of the tech enthusiasts in America. But, you know, we're in San Francisco and we're kind of in a bubble here. But, you know, there's a lot of other markets and a lot of tech enthusiasts that want these uh, want this additional utility, and I think it, once people realize what is already available and what's continuing to happen, I mean, really, I feel like across OEMs, there's just just major gains. I mean, that's a beautiful launch, you know. Like, there's, it, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's gonna it's gonna take shape rapidly, and um, yeah. So I actually don't think the hardware constraints are stifling the growth currently. I actually think they're they're further ahead than consumers realize currently. Yeah, we've definitely gone leaps and bounds in the last few years, you know. Like it's amazing to think we can fit a beautiful curved touchscreen and a beautiful like display and interaction and trying to solve all the UI problems of that kind of space, you know, your thumb literally covers the entire freaking screen. <laughs> so uh, you know we're we're learning a lot, right, as a culture and as a technology and as an industry. You know, we're learning how to interact with it. Um, there's a reason the iPad didn't come out first, right? The iPhone came first to teach people how to use it. There's a learning curve on the audience side, too, education. Um, you know, the technology is limiting. Battery is the biggest constraint, but in volume, not necessarily capacity. 
Uh, the other challenges we face is that batteries just don't accelerate in their capacity, like 30% improvement. Per they're not like Moore's, Moore's Law or they're every, not. every yeah. two years. Yeah, oh, totally. Right. So we have to solve the battery problem in silicon. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, this technology is very different. Uh, you know, the best technology, sorry Samsung, the best technology maker in the world is having a delay on their product, right? Apple should have launched their watch this year. They're like four months before. <coughs> And that company is an expert in operations, if, you know, biggest company in the world. Um, we've seen this, you know, even Fitbit is having trouble launching their heart rate products. Um, it's just really hard to build these things. And people are learning, and they're going to get better, and they're going to, like, take cell phones, right? You know, Samsung's cycle on cell phones, what, like six months now? It's incredible. It's amazingly fast. As people educate, and as people know how to build these things, we can do better things faster. We can also learn what not to do anymore, like, you know, Silly things like sweat sensing. Who cares about that? <laughs> There's a breathalyzer when they saw Korea. <laughs> oh, for example, uh, uh, talking about your example, uh, I think uh, sleep analysis is a huge opportunity because there's a lot of people suffering of sleep trouble and they never seek cure. And I'm not talking about the people who suffer from apnea, which are only 3% of this 23%. So I think. We have the wearable, we have the technology, the sensor, and now uh, uh, the company has to build a service, and people are, they have to know that this service exists and they can solve the problem. So I think there's also uh, the app side and the service side that needs to be built on all these wearables and sensors, and we are kind of like at the beginning of what is possible. All right, guys, I have one more question before we go to the audience. So what's, what's the hot holiday gift that everyone wants? <laughs> what did, what did, what did, if you're going to buy a gift or you want a gift, what would you want? What's the, what's the, what's the hot wearable of today? Blaine. A non-connected object for me? I have too many. On my side, I know that like, people are really, uh, they really want the Moto uh, 360. So that's uh, one of the coolest smartwatch that people they really are attracted to. So if I have a gift to, uh, to offer, I would do that. Is there anybody from Motorola in the audience? Julia? Sorry, Samsung. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have yours yet, so I didn't try it yet. I, uh, all right, uh, how about you? What's, uh, what, what would you what's the cool guy? What's, what's you the want me to pick my own product? Or <laughs> <laughs> what is the hot product that's being ordered right now? There must be something that's actually Poppy that you're seeing that hey this one is really really popular. Well, look, my my customer is really different than the customer of everybody on this panel. Yeah. Um, I do. I will tell you this. Um, well, two things. I know a lot. Of my I'm married into tech. My husband's my software web guy, and he definitely wants the new the uh, is it the new up band that can tell what sport you're actually playing. Hmm. You know what, do you know what I'm talking about? I think the there was a press release like yeah, yesterday. Yeah, he wants that. I will tell you why people are buying my stuff for holiday gifts. Uh, one of the, which goes against almost everything everybody set up here, uh, there's, this is the idea that you don't, some people don't want their entire phone um, on their wrist. Some people want to curate their technology more, and they want it more tailored to their needs, and maybe they don't want a screen. And maybe they want to um, come back into control of how they're using tech. And a lot of people think that some of the habit forming um, notification functions of Cuff are gonna help their family stay more connected and like look each other in the eyes at dinner and, and which they would like for the next year. Interesting. How about the Wonder Woman bracelets? Do you have the you we'll have one of those? I do. There'll be a demonstration that, that afterwards. That looks really cool. Pull it through. Black and gold. <laughs> we'll ask what you can. I don't know how you'll land. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a long All right, Darren, Darren the, man that has so, every, the man that has everything. Yes, so um, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, taking the basis peak for a test drive this, uh, this holiday season, and I'll explain why, because I'm a triathlete, and I have the Garmin system, and it's a lot of different pieces, and I would love something accurate enough for me to... So you're wearing, the, you're wearing the chest heart rate monitor. You yeah, I got, I got a little yeah. foot sensor. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's it's a real pain in the butt. So uh, if challenges out, if you deliver on the promises, I'll be very happy. <laughs> Personally. Game on. <laughs>
So if the rumors are true, I want to get the Gear VR at the beginning of December. That what one, what, that is, that, what, is, what, is, what is, is that? What is that? I saw on. So watching. it's compatible with the Note 4, and it just basically pops into the wearable headset. Okay. And um, it's virtual reality. It's a partnership with Oculus. Cool. Okay. So they're you know supplying the content and cool. their specialty. So I really want that. You know, it's one of the first to market, and I think it would be, you know, cool. really good to to learn more about it mm -hmm. and um, you know enter that world. All right, all right, Bash. You, it, this is off the record. This is Bash without the bases hat. What, what were you looking at? <laughs> a trip to the Bahamas. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen a, a very, very um, old thing. Uh, uh, it won the Intel uh, wearable competition like uh, two days ago. It's a wearable drone. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That was wearable awesome. drone. So for so, for self yeah, for selfies. Yeah. Yeah. So fly it, and it, it took it's, it's take taking it to selfies. Selfies. take selfies. Of <laughs> <laughs> really cool. Um, Intel fun. Intel uh, contest. Yeah, it's a contest. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm gonna take like the three questions from the audience, and it's uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she totally did. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my name is Natasha Blanty, and when Mario was earlier about he wanted to leave his phone at home and just uh, wear the watch and then also Mike was making a comment about everything now on the watch and yet then I was comparing my seatmate here has the LG smartphone and comparing cool. that oh sorry a smart watch rather and um, you know comparing that to my traditional citizen eco drive analog lady size watch and also, also thinking about how we're all getting older and I guess as we get older it gets small harder to read the fine for me how is that really going to be reality, at least for us ladies wearing the traditional lady size of one? There's going to be some cool breakthroughs in display technology soon. Um, you know, it's an interesting one. Ladies size watches are notoriously, well, difficultly small, uh, especially for hardware where the battery is bigger than most of these watches. Um, and, you know, accessibility with, you know, impaired vision and impaired motor control. Like these are all problems to be solved for you know, the, the aging population, but also people who have uh, illnesses. Um, and there's there's some interesting creative things that we've yet to explore. I would argue that the uh, the Apple's digital crown is is just brilliant, like a completely new method of interacting with electronics. And it took a lot of people to make that work, but uh, we're going to see innovation like that continue to to. to grow as we start to create more and more devices that do more interesting things? Um, I've seen uh, uh, some attempt to do uh, more feminine looking watches and it's coming. The problem right now was like the volume of uh, the unit shipped were not very, uh, um, uh, very high so it's a cost reduction uh, problem. Or chicken and egg thing, yeah. Um, um, yes, yeah. so at the beginning of the wearables, they didn't ship enough. You know, specifically startups. I'm not talking about Samsung or Apple. Apple actually did two models: one for women, one for men. Uh, the weird things they solved, they kind of solved that problem by doing. Uh, they calculated the exact size for a watch to be not uh, too big for a woman, not too small for a man. And the designer actually explained that uh, uh, to us on stage. I have a solution. We just convinced the fashion industry to make big is sexy. Big is better. A little retro, ginormous watches. They don't solve all the problems. But uh, let's go. Let's get another uh, another question out of here. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. So uh, maybe for Deepa, but I'd also be curious from the rest of the uh, audience. Uh, at Salesforce, an unlikely place. Uh, Will I am presented his fashion yeah. cuff device. I'm curious to get your reactions to that, which was very oriented towards not only the health and fitness and the interactivity and everything, but also trying at least to bring in that fashion hip component that might make these types of devices more popular. Yeah, it's funny, when it came out, a bunch of my friends said, did you partner with Will I Am? <laughs> because he called it a cuff. Um, look, I, I think there's gonna be lots of different ways that people try to bridge the fashion function divide. If Apple is hiring the Burberry lady and the YSL lady, they know it too, a Burberry lady, YSL man, uh, they know that too. Everybody's looking at it. Um, in talent opening ceremony, which is a niche brand that a lot of people don't know, they're trying to figure out how to make this. It, it, it dovetails into habit forming, right? 
uh, to Will I Am's piece, I, I think it's really cool that he's going to, you know, shepherd in again and socialize the concept to people who might not have understood what wearables do. I think his device is still, it's very, he wants it to, like, uh, from what I read, it's going to, like, you know, solve world hunger, right? Like, it's like the holograms are going to come out from it. It can do everything. And, right, and unicorns, all these words, platforms, systems, networks, they're all going to come out from Williams Cup, right? Big data everywhere. But I, I, I think he's a harbinger of what's to come. Uh, he's, he's awesome. Like, I, when I, I went to CES for the first time, and I saw him, like, with the... 3D systems guy like printing stuff out. He does these programs for kids in school. I, I think he's he's uh, I think he's a pretty cool person to help um, uh, bring exposure to the area. I'm not completely um, sure uh, about the, the the saturation his particular product can have, but I think he's going to be part of uh, this movement that's going to make this uh, you know uh, we'll, 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 and we'll go from the wild wild west to the lesser wild west of wearables. <laughs> So it's, um, and yeah, we were we actually reached out to the product guys from um, from from Will I Am's team to come out, but they couldn't come out. Um, let's go for another question. Okay, glasses. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Julia. I run a fashion tech blog, actually called Technically Sweet, and I love the shine because it is a little bit more on the feminine side. I have a question for Mike. I went to the Pulse. Uh, Expo and saw the release, and I was dying to see a demo. Can you like, can you give us a little, <laughs> hi, you know, or text on it or something? I'm just so curious. So like, I could call Mike. Like you know, I, I, I want to. I was, I was at an AT and T store this weekend, and it was there. They have it on display at the AT and T store now. See what you call it? A working version. Yeah, it be great. A work, yeah, it was a working version. I could actually do. Let's go the whole round. Hi, gear. Call Mario Mobile Monday. This better work. <laughs> <laughs> Calling mom. <laughs> <laughs> it actually, it, yeah, it got the whole message of that. So it's like, let me actually just manually call it. Let's see here. And it has its own phone number, or is it using? It's is it pairing up from your from your actual phone? It is currently it's tethered. Because well, that's he's asking about the pulse. Well, the pulse never gave a demo. He never gave a demo. It was just a thing. So we're. Here we go. Look, look, look. Where is it? Hello. 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 Watson, come in here right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually much better when you're driving because you put a hand on the right. wheel this morning. I'll drive back here. Well, that is cool. You don't have to like come. So, so do, has, has anyone drunk dialed from a <laughs> If I do, I don't remember. <laughs> Possibly. It, it has a sensor technology, right, for blood alcohol. <laughs> the thing is that you, yeah. you want to do, like, yeah. so, so there's, a, there's an executive at, at, at CTIA in D.C., and uh, and he was the first guy to do a drug. He, literally, there were only two phones at the time, uh, back in the 70s, and he he, he drunk out one of his ex-girlfriends. He's like, ah, the the first guy, and he's very proud of it. <laughs> cool. Um, Thank you. That was awesome. Uh, you're welcome. You know, one thing is, it was kind of neat. I was... I got dinner this week with uh, one of our main strategy guys uh, in wearables, and he just got back from New York Fashion Week. And I think there was, you know, currently a lot of our conversation was around accessorizing with wearables instead of actually getting into deep hardware. Um, I think, you know, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of room for this. I mean, watch bands, things of that nature, which I believe will um, have an influence on UI. And like you mentioned with Apple. That I think all OEMs are hiring design talent because they see the importance of it. But part of um, the next steps, I think, are getting the general consumers for the devices. And the more people go out and buy a wearable, and the more wearables you buy, the more uh, innovations you will see. Cool. I just want to mention um, uh, there's a demo table here in the back called Trigger. I've heard the guys from Trigger. 
They also do augmented reality and stuff like that. I think you also have hardware. Is that their part of their something? Uh, you were developing a, um, a camera system which is uh, 180 degrees vertical, 360 degrees horizontal, and we worked with Samsung on the release of the gear platform. So come and have a look at our 360 technology. Yeah, you guys are over here in the back. Um, you guys want to do one more question? Okay, one more. Last. Okay. Oh, and they're in the red. Oh, I need a. <laughs> trickiest things we're dealing with right now. It's almost like we're super lucky that we're a young, scrappy startup and large fashion brands are reaching out to us. I do believe that answer is part of your question, right? I think they're looking to partner with people who will do the tech side. Every single one who's coming to me says, we have literally no interest in being a tech company. Show us what's possible. So my forward-facing brand almost is becoming a showcase for what is possible. I'll put a handbag up there and put a sensor in it, not because I want to make handbags, but so that other people who make handbags are like, oh, look what I can do, right? So it becomes sort of like um, a catwalk for the fashion people so they can understand, I get to be a translator, right? Between what you guys all get and what they get. But you're, some, of the, some of what you're bringing up has been some of the, um, you know, not the most glamorous parts of wearables, but some of the really interesting responsibilities of people like me who are um, going to partner with very, very large brands and it's some of the hardest parts of contract negotiation and some of the hardest parts of what my warranties are. Um, I wish I had an easy answer for you. Um, I do believe that we have, a, um, we, people like me, have the ability to educate these brands on what is possible, on what is expected, what um, room for um, error is and where there is room for error, but it's becoming um, a case-by-case -case situation. For instance, you take my three functions, security, notification, fitness, there's a lot less room for error and security than there is in um, notification or whether you've lost your keys, right? So it's becoming um, sort of um, one of the biggest parts of my job is figuring out how to service brands properly. Uh, totally. Um, so, you know, we think the aesthetic is extremely important. Um, you know, our belief in kind of seeing where things are going is that we believe things, you know, lifestyle and how you represent yourself is going to be one of the big barriers for adoption for wearables. Um, you know, the fashion industry is just such a different industry. They have like a four release cycles per year for a new product. They ship multiple products. Their product margin or profit margin is so much higher. Um, they're just, you know, they, the way they think about product and flow and inventory is so different uh, than an electronics company where, you know, we are lucky if we ship one or two products a year, um, two new you know, features, new big product. Uh, you know, we have a very, intro, like, very consistent and repeatable flow for when product goes through. We have generally, like, set up certain practices for accepting returns, for right. issuing support, all that type of stuff. And that's all very different when you start to blend the two together. And much like we're learning, you know, what actually is useful in wearables, you know, we're also going to start to learn how to how to start merging those two spaces of technology and fashion. And you know, I 
love to talk more about this because I'm just now starting to dive in, but it's, it's really exciting stuff to see what we can really get away with on the technology side to make it both reliable and non-intrusive. Right now, you can wash your shirt, but you can't wash your watch. Can I get a basis in a violet color like your hair? <laughs> if you're really nice to me. Your hair is violet? It's beautiful. Yes. All right, guys. Well, th I, thank you very much for giving these guys a hand. Uh, there's still more food and drinks in the back, and you guys are welcome to mingle. I think the panelists are going to hang out for, for all the questions. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.